bottom of it. So I'll carry on. Um, I just, I put in a, I've put a couple of slides back in to take them out. Um, just, um, to just address this question about um, <coughs> scattering of x-rays and, uh, and neutrons. So, in x-rays, with, with x-rays, obviously, the, uh, the x-rays are being scattered by the electrons, <laughs> and the atomic structure factor is uh, proportional to z, or to a factor of the proportion to z. So, the, you know, the scattering amplitude proportion to z, cross-section is proportional to z squared. And now the uh, size of the atoms is comparable with the wavelength of the x-rays we want to use. And that actually gives you a scattering factor uh, which decreases with Q, falls off. I'll show you more about that in a moment. But it's, it falls off, obviously it's going to fall off quite quickly. If you think about the ratio of the scattering cross-section for hydrogen, nickel or something, it's going to be huge. The difference is going to be Z squared. So X-rays, it turns out, are actually very, very poor for looking at lighter elements. So depending on the sort of structure you're looking at, sometimes you know, if there's some carbon in, if some carbon in there or uh, uh, hydrogen in there, you might find it rather hard to see some of the elements. Uh, some of the peaks will be very, very small. Uh, if you go to neutrons, I didn't emphasize this because I was talking about the um, magnetic scattering. In actual fact, they've got some advantage just for determining structures because they uh, experience a strong force. It's a very short range interaction. So the, uh, the nucleus is pretty much a, a point particle compared to the wavelength of the neutrons. That actually gives you an essentially uh, scattering wave vector independent uh, uh, structure factor there. Um, which has an advantage I'll mention in a moment. Um, but then when you actually look at the scattering cross-sections, it varies in this fairly erratic way. And in, apparently it's very, very hard to work these things out because it's very sensitive to the details of the nuclear structures. But what it means is that uh, the neutrons uh, can be really quite sensitive to uh, light elements. And you can also do tricks with neutrons, whereas if you can make some samples where you've got some uh, isotropic substitution, you can really pin down which size is which for the lighter elements. So they do scatter off the nuclei, they scatter off the magnetic moments. But then when they scatter off the magnetic moments, it's the outer electrons which uh, are, have the unpaired spin or the orbital motions associated. So now this is worse than x-rays in terms of the, the scattering factor. So if you look at it here, they, they, as a function of scattering angle, as a function of Q, the cross-section doesn't vary for neutrons. Uh, it drops off quite fast for x-rays. It drops off very fast for magnetic uh, neutron scattering. And, and that can be a real nuisance because you can see this is going to modulate the size of your piece. So if you've got um, if you determine structures uh, for uh, neutron scattering, then your peaks are going to be at 10, 10 times a very large scattering of the cube as a very small cube. But if you try to determine a magnetic structure, you're going to find it very hard to see those peaks out of a large cube. Uh, that's a nuisance because you might find it hard to see individual peaks. But the other problem is that you really quite like to work out at large scattering angles because the resolution goes roughly as 1 over cos theta. Okay, so you get much better resolution. So it's often a good idea to work out with work with higher order diffractions because it puts you in a region where the resolution is, is good. But out with magnetic neutron scattering where the resolution is good, the intensity is strongly suppressed. Right, okay. Um, this is a slide I showed. So, 1D uh, model of paramagnet with just uniaxial anisotropy. You, depending on whether you're perpendicular to the easy axis or parallel to the easy axis, you just see straight line behavior to saturation, or you ideally see a square loop here with a spin flip transition from one direction to the other. Oh, what happened there? Maybe, oh, oh. Antiferromagnet. Okay, so Helen Helen has already talked about this, but I'll, I'll talk about it in my hand way anyway. Very classical. So, for antiferromagnet, 
you need to include the intersub lattice exchange energy. I've got a uniaxial energy in here, and we've got a Zeeman energy. <coughs> Single domain, um, easy access to, uh, sorry, um, uniaxial behavior. In the limit again, the exchange energy is by far the largest <coughs> energy in the problem. So what happens is, if I put the magnetic field perpendicular to the easy axis, it looks like it's going wall path for a fire magnet. All that happens is those moments will, will move up towards the uh, applied field. So eventually, it will saturate it, but you have to go, go all the way out to pretty much the exchange energy. So it's going to be incredibly hard to apply a large enough field to saturate more sample But the other behavior that um, Pam told us about was the spin flop behavior. So now, if I apply the uh, magnetic field along the easy axis, initially, as I increase the field, nothing happens. Here's the blue here. And so I get to a critical field. So just from this expression for the energy, if you just uh, minimize that, then you can easily find out where this transition is occurring. And it's occurring at where the Zeeman energy is about the square root of twice the exchange energy to down to the anisotropic energy. And then it goes from the... <laughs> I shouldn't do, do this, should I? I'm going to fall over it. I know it's been around. I've done this too many times in, the, in lectures. I do a bit about uh, absorption molecules in the atmosphere. I have talked about collisional broadening. So I get a couple of students to sort of where in, in vibrational modes to run around the lecture theatre bumping into each other to see just how it's impossible to actually stay the same item. <laughs> um, right, what's going to say? It's completely irrelevant, don't write that down. Um, okay, so now it starts off with, with moments opposite. You get to a point where it jumps into, into a new state where they both come past the midpoint here. They're still not along, normally they're still not along the applied field, of which is the same as the, uh, the actual easy axis. And so you get a jump in field. Now it will carry on closing up these angles and it will get to a fully saturated behavior before it did in the perpendicular direction because now you put, you're working with the anisotropy and rather than against the anisotropy. So you should be able to see this and this, if you measure spin, the spin flop field then it's giving you some information about the, at least the product of the exchange of the anisotropy energy. However, this is for small KU. It's not so simple for a large KU. It's not so simple, you can't write down a little simple expression in this case at all. But what can happen is you can actually get the situation where you start off with, with the moments anti-parallel, you go up in the field, they stay anti-parallel, but when they then finally flip, not drawn properly here, sorry, for this case, they actually end up just parallel. So it's just, it goes back to being a flip, spin, flip case. So there's a window in which you can, you can see a spin flop. Uh, this is actually the same figure. <laughs> I couldn't even remember where I got it from, so I haven't got a reference. So, finally, um, and you can see here, it's actually obviously some of those single crystal, it's actually quite hard to align with. I would guess the best that you do is two and a half degrees off. But it stays, uh, the magnetization stays unmeasurable until it actually transfers transitions into quite a high uh, magnetization and then it carries on up to the final saturation. Uh, I just, uh, I put this, I made this, obviously made these slides available, but you might want to have a look at, uh, at this paper here. Um, it's not published in a very prestigious journal because it's dotting I's and crescent T's, but it's just an example of a really, really nice piece of experimental work. Because this is now, oh sorry, this is now um, a primary reference, but showing the spin flop transition. So now, if you start off at zero applied field, you've got, uh, well, if you could detect it, you have a mold. Uh, and as you increase the field, the, uh, the energy of that mold increases. Sorry, if you're perpendicular to the easy uniaxial axis. If you're parallel to the easy axis, 
what happens is the energy increases or decreases linearly, it splits it, until you get to, up to the spin flip transition, and then these collapse, and, and the, 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 it, it's flipped, but it, it's like flop, and flop, and then it carries on up in energy. So the whole of this uh, observed behavior fits uh, really very well with these simple approximate expressions which were derived back in the 50s. This was before I was born. Okay, so if you put large enough fields on, you can induce the magnetization. Uh, and the easy controllable thing to do if you want to do magnetometry with this is to apply your uh, field perpendicular to an easy axis because then you can, you can tilt the moments to a degree. And one way of exploiting this, which seemed to be quite popular um, back in the day, 63, but I haven't seen much of more recently, uh, is to do torque magnetometry. Okay, so this is an interesting material, the alpha manganese telluride, and it's, uh, it's a, a hexagonal structure, and there are three possible domains in this. Uh, and so uh, you might expect a, a six fold symmetry, which is demonstrated very nicely in this torque magnetometry manual. Um, just concentrate on the one. Uh, Solid, yeah, the solid line, that was the first time they uh, cooled their sample down, it deteriorated after that. So what's, been, what's happened there, uh, really skillful as well, we've taken a single crystal disc that drilled a fine hole through the middle of it, put a, a fibre yep, on that, and then attached some little mirror onto that, and fire, fire a uh, 63 laser, the light, fire light anyway. Uh, onto this mirror and then rotate the magnetic field in the, in the plane. Okay. And so what's going to happen is the little disc will, will be pulled towards it and then back and forth and it will oscillate backwards and forward because of this very uh, torque. So very nice way to demonstrate the symmetry and you can actually get some numbers out of that about what the um, anisotropies are. There's another one much more recently Showing uh, simple behavior. But it's quite interesting because now we've got 3.3 tensor, you can see it. So I actually had thought that you needed much larger fields than you, than you do to see something like that. Um, it's a very promising, interesting idea of something that would not apply to any of our materials. Uh, another interesting way of looking at the, um, the presence of uh, magnetic order, anti ferromagnetic order here is zero field uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay, if you apply a, a magnetic field to a material, then you can get uh, resonance associated with the processional motion of the nuclear. Okay. Uh, and you can do this for, for any, any nuclear sort of moment. So what's going on here is, um, this is European uh, gallium forward, and this is varying frequency and looking for resonances okay, without any applied field. Okay? And in a paramagnetic material you see nothing. But here you see very distinct absorptions of peaks and they've, they've, they've got multiplets associated with a particular uh, nuclear structure. So you can actually see characteristic nuclear magnetic resonance and you can associate them with particular atoms, types of atoms, out of this structure. The reason you can see it is it anti ferromagnetic order. So every equivalent site is in sitting in the same field. Okay? It's not disordered. So if you can see uh, this sort of signal, uh, then you can infer what the strength of magnetic fields are from UTI uh, and the symmetry of magnetic fields are. So this, this is a very nice paper. So here's the strength of these magnetic fields produced by the anti ferromagnetic order. So the europium is actually 27 tesla or so. And these are the big fields. The gallium is 3 tesla or so. So this is a very, very nice thing to do. Um, Way to talk, when we did, we've got a, people who knew to magnetic resonance at Nottingham. Um, and apparently the biggest problem here is you've got to find your resonances. So the easy thing to do is to fix a frequency and just vary the field. 
you know, sweep, uh, sweep your magnetic field over a wide range. Um, it's, but here, you, don't, you need to have some idea of where, you, where you're looking, which frequency you look, range you're looking in. And then you have to have an appropriate spectrometer that works in that frequency range. Um, so so uh, you have to find the friendly um, NMR spectroscopist who actually has the appropriate equipment. This is the uh, interesting anti-ferromagnetic to go. And this is, uh, again, a nice piece of work. So here's a, a single crystal sample. And they've managed to find uh, that the peak, the mutant magnetic resonance peaks associated with the, with the magnetic in this. It, it's, uh, it's, it's split into the five things you'd expect. Uh, and it's really very nice. But then they took a, 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 a polycrystal. No, sorry. It's not a single crystal. Right, that's an important point. You don't need single crystals, okay? Because no matter where they crystallize the point, it doesn't matter. Because it's where the atoms are with respect to where the moment is. So now they've got a polycrystallized sample, we still see a very nice um, behavior. But then they apply a magnetic field to it. So imagine every magnetic site is sitting in 10 tesla or whatever, due to the antiferromagnetic order around it. Uh, no, well, let's say one. <laughs> Probably less. Uh, so then they apply, but it's polycrystallized, so each site is experiencing the same field, but off the original crystallized point in different direction. Then they apply a field to it. So then you get every field, uh, every other bank side, you get a whole range of fields from uh, the hyperfine field produced by the, uh, by the moments, plus off the uh, applied field all the way to the applied field minus the half point, and it disappears. So I thought it was a rather nice demonstration. A simple thing, if you want to find out the video, the new temperature is to do specific heat measurements. Again, I say simple, it's simple if you've got nice big samples. It's also simpler, a lot simpler if your new temperature happens to be very low. So, you expect a divergence, set up for transition, you expect a divergence in the specific heat at the new temperature. So you can look for that. Here's some beautiful work going back to 75, and absolutely beautiful, uh, random like um, singularity in the specific heat. This is the total specific heat. But what makes that very, oh, I'm sure it wasn't easy, I'm sure it wasn't easy at the time, but what makes it relatively easy is here they're plotting on what the lattice specific heat is. So the dominant contribution is actually a magnetic contribution. Um, more recent measurements um, on the bulk or bromic of magnetic arsenide, the cubic of the magnetic antinomide, you can see peaks, they're, they're very thick, but you can pick out the TC from that. But this is a harder measurement because you've got a large background uh, specific heat here as well. Oh, yeah. But if you don't want to um, build yourself a microcalorimeter, you can look at uh, resistance to transaction. Okay. I won't read all the words on that. But if you have these spin fluctuations in the critical region, they're going to, they're going to scatter uh, the carriers, so you expect it's put into your magnetic system and the carrier system. You expect some sort of indication of the critical behavior in the resistivity of flow. So if you go through the theory, it's a years ago, what you actually expect it for ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic semiconductors, where the moment density is large compared to the carrier density, it's only long wavelengths uh, fluctuations, spin fluctuations, which are going to cause scattering. And in that situation, the form of the susceptible of, of the resistivity should be rather like the form of the specific heat. Sorry, it should be rather like the form of the susceptibility. So here's uh, new oxide, uh, near temperature 73, very nice peak. Here's my new telluride, peak up at about 310 Kelvin where it should be, and here's another theoretical fit to that. 
I guess they have to be tweaked with disorder in the in the calculation quite a bit. Anyway. Inside, however, you look at materials that were the more density is comparable with the, car with the carrier density. So, for instance, I just happened to pick up this one, strontium protein oxide, some metal, the carrier density is about the same as the mold density. What you find, it's quite hard to see on here, is that uh, those circles are the derivative of the reference to this metal. And the line is the measure specific heat. So the, the derivative of the of resistivity actually for that the same functional form as this cost in the specific heat. Here's our measurements on uh, what are all those bits which means? Well, more broadly arrows, we all find the um, on the dilute parameters, I mean we've got uh, uh, a couple of magnets last night. Uh, and in this material, it's called a it's called a semiconductor because it's a band, but the number of carriers which are whole is about the same as the number of magnets. So like a like a metal of nickel, they they fall into this class where you expect a uh, derivative of <coughs> a peak in the rule by E T. This is very useful, okay, because up nearly every other technique I've mentioned so far is very hard, like you need access to facilities and so on. Uh, pretty much anybody can measure resistivity. You don't have to feel it. You need a quality, a reasonable quality sample because these peaks get broadened out by disorder, as you would expect. But here's the case for the for the guy who made his arsenide. Um, here's the peak, less well defined, but well defined enough for the the copper one is uh, arsenide. So here's some of the neutron dation before the, this is falling down to zero to around. Uh, 480, uh, and the peak here is a bit below 480. What happens is it's sort of broadening, always pushes these peaks down uh, below the real um, uh, temperature. Uh, in actual fact, we don't really know how many carriers we've got in the copper manganese outside. It's a semi metal with rather a lot, rather a lot of carriers for a semi metal, or it's a metal with rather <coughs> few carriers for a metal. But you can see a clear peak, and you can use that. So we've done a lot of work which draws a sample, with the Richard Vicky draws a sample, it goes into the high temperature system, you can measure it you know, in the next day or so, and you can get information about where the name temperature is. Oh, that's a nice one. Um, so this was grown with, this is a couple of these like grown with excess um, manganese, uh, which is actually a sample from very early days. And I think you can see it very well here, but this is a, an NFM picture. And there's these little inclusions, some micron inclusions, but quite pretty big. And you can see the dark uh, white light, bright contrast, the little magnetic dipole. And what they are are ferromagnetic magnetic arsenide uh, inclusions inside a, let's see. Yes, ferromagnetic magnetic arsenide inclusions in a copper manganese arsenide matrix. In actual fact, it, it, it illustrates to how this material copper manganese arsenide really wants to form, it really wants to be stored in metric, because it actually expels the excess manganese, which somehow ends up being mocked up by the arsenic and forming this manganese arsenide. But I, I show you this mainly because I just like this picture. So here's one sample, and this is derivative of resistivity as well as the temperature. You can see the needle temperature, and you can see the cure temperature uh, of those little ferromagnetic inclusions. Oh yeah, just to say a few words about critical exponents. When I said that you expect divergences in specific heat susceptibility in ferromagnet, in ferromagnet um, etc., um, these should show parallel-like behavior if you're close enough to the critical temperature. And in a ferromagnet, the magnetization of the order parameter, and you've got several um, critical exponents, beta, gamma, alpha, which are showing that give you the polar behavior of magnetization on temperature, separate, specific, et cetera. As Hannah has told us, the order parameter, the appropriate order parameter is the anti is the difference in the magnetization of the sub-lattices. 
So now you expect this to show actually the same parallel behavior as the magnetization, but that's very, very hard to measure, really hard to measure, because you have to measure this parameter L, which you have to get from neutrons or something. And you have to measure it accurately close to the critical temple. That's a very, very hard. It turns out to be accurate measurements. You need to be within a percent or so of the critical temperature. So the accessible one is the specific heat. So I showed you some custom specific heat, right? Very nice. Oh, say to the experts. If you can do really accurate measurements of these thermodynamic properties close to the uh, critical temperature, you can get these exponents out. If you then compare them with the models of uh, the mean field model, the three D Heisenberg model, and so on, you might be able to get some information about the range of uh, the interaction, the exchange interaction, the dimensional reality of the system, and so on. Um, but we put quite a bit of effort onto this. We've been getting on these last night, and we found it was really quite hard work. Um, we, after quite a bit of work, we managed to convince ourselves that the galley magnets outside was showing the 3D Heisenberg behavior, with very reasonable numbers for uh, and gamma. And in, in the end, we, we declined to write down the number for alpha from our fittings. Uh, this is published. Uh, published yeah, yeah. Years and years, this um, For various reasons. Okay, so can you do the same in an antiquary magnet? Well, these people think you can. Um, by, from 2005, so this is um, a series of materials here where they measure the cost in this specific heat uh, and they fit it. In actual fact, to my mind, these, these measurements aren't anything like as good as the measurements I showed earlier on from the 60s. Um, but they are at high temperature. So they try to, calculate, uh, try to extract the, the coefficient alpha, which gives you the same thing. Now, I, I've been a little bit glib because there's another correction term to the, the simple power law. And then you've got behavior on a, which is associated with the lattice and every other contribution. So they allowed themselves to fit this, they allowed themselves a free uh, fitting parameters. But they don't actually mention uh, or discuss the biggest, the other key fitting parameter that they put into it. And that's the range over which they've chosen to fit it. So you can see here it's not working very close to the critical temperature. So they just choose to fit over a range from here to here to here to here. And our experience is that if you freely allow yourself to choose the range, you can almost get any, any value you want. So um, there's at least 10 fitting fitting parameters in here, uh, and they get a value because it ties them both like um, I wouldn't much point. Uh, except perhaps that if your supervisor suggests that you spend all your spend your uh, PhD studying critical exponents, you might suggest that you might be able to put in more interesting things to do. I'll say something about my magnetic diagram. Well, that's loads of time for you. Okay, so, so Peter's um, uh, talking uh, about uh, diaphragm results um, in some detail uh, on the Copenhagen's Arsenal system. Uh, so I will say, I try not to call out too much of what it says. Okay. So I said something earlier about uh, using x ray scattering. We've got a lab system, very convenient. Um, but they tend to be a fixed energy. Um, you choose uh, one target in the, well, you'll have, have several that you can interchange, but you, you only have a limited number of energies. Uh, and also, the uh, x rays that you choose are going to be unpolarized. If you go to a synchrotron source, um, then you've got a vast range of uh, photon energies you can choose from. You can have very, very high fluxes, so you can do experiments which wouldn't be possible in the lab. You can have uh, high coherence, and you can have controllable polarization. It can be linear and easy. But of course, it's limited availability. 
Um, so you, all of the synchrotrons uh, tend to have open uh, schemes where you can put in proposals to uh, do experiments, but you really have to do a lot of work to, to talk to the to people on the beam lines to make sure that your proposal is doable and exciting enough to, to get to funding. So, limit, so you have this limited availability. Um, again, as I was saying about the TDM people, it's, it's really important to be very nice to beam line scientists <laughs> because they've got a hard job. And what tends to happen is enthusiastic uh, students, scientists come along, they've got one project they want to do. It's the most important thing in the world. Uh, it's crazy that no one else can't see this, but, but their experiment is incredibly important. So they come along, they leave the place untidy, they crux don't, they do damage to the equipment. Um, whereas the beamline scientists have to work on lots and lots and lots of different experiments. Okay? And they have to manage the whole thing. So you all get incredibly nice beamline scientists. X-ray magnetic circuit and the diaphragm. Okay. So this is the easier one. Because now we're going to try and excite transitions with x-rays from low-lying, uh, rather sharp, uh, atomic-like states, well below the Fermi level, up to the Fermi level. <coughs> now, if I do circuit polarized light, then that transition, and I've got some spin polarization at the Fermi level, that transition is going to depend on the relative orientation of the ferromagnet, the magnetization, and the uh, and the direction of the uh, circular polarization. So here's, um, oh, I didn't say what this was. Is this coming my knees last night? It will be one thing. Yeah. Um, or I am the Taylor Price. Yeah, it's I am, I am, it's I am. So here, there's two measurements, uh, red and black, with the magnetization anti-parallel <coughs> to the circular polarization and parallel to the circular polarization. And you can see there's a difference in the absorption. That difference, when you make that subtraction and get the blue curve, that is what is known as the X-ray magnetic circular diaphorism. Diaphorism just means the difference in the absorption for two colors, traditionally, historically. But we use it to mean the difference in two um, polarizations. Now that's at a particular absorption edge. It's going to, so the tech is going to be uh, sensitive to the unfilled density state of the Fermi energy. It actually gives you combined chemical and magnetic information. It can give you FB, an element specific magnetometer, and give you depth information, depending on, the, I won't go into this, unless that one I'm going to. But it depends on the way you detect the absorption. Uh, there are different ways of detecting it, which give you a very different sensitivity to the surface. And there are accepted uh, calculation methods to actually get a semi quantitative angle on the size of the orbit of the spin moment. Right. Yeah, this is going on your knees last night. So this is a transition from a deep lying uh, 2 p state to 3 d state uh, near the Fermi energy. So if you take these spectra and you fit them using what we refer to as the sum rules, which I get reference to here, you can get a number for the start of a moment per uh, manganese in this case. And here, there's the blue up, the numbers that came out of this experiment, and the black is the magnetization uh, measured uh, in the squid magnetometer. And those things match onto each other quite well. So it, 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 it's semi quantitative We're not primarily interested in ferromagnets, we're more interested in the anti ferromagnets So the, if you have spin polarized, polarized uh, beams, then you're sensitive to the ferromagnetic void. If you have linearly polarized um, beams, then you're sensitive to any difference between, in, in the structure between 
one polarization and that, that at 90 degrees to it. So you're going to actually be sensitive to strain, you're going to be uh, structural, electric, um, anisotropies, and any magnetic anisotropy. And this magnetic anisotropy, now that it's not circuit, but it's linear, it's polarized, it can be used for a magnetic. So, which we can signal for a difficult experiment. So, the uh, red here is the linear dichroism. The difference in shining your uh, X ray beam onto the copper magnetic arsenide is case, the one uh, orientation, and that perpendicular to it. So, this clearly is a difference, and the difference is because the moments are aligned uh, align in a particular direction. And here, there's no, there was no attempt to actually extract the moment from this, I think it's like, no, 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 here is just, uh, it's fitted, yeah. yeah, it's just, it, it, it's fitted, so this is just the amplitude of the, uh, integrated amplitude of the actual linear diagonal, and you see it falling off over a limited range here, uh, compared to uh, what we were getting earlier. Um, you can put a function through that, which gives you the same yield temperature. Uh, I wouldn't really want to do it the other way around in this case. Just one more, just one more example here. Um, looking for the dichroism, uh, where you're not always looking for the difference between two orthogonal uh, directions of polarization. Um, but now, <coughs> then from the, where we're rotating the sample. So here, uh, black is along one, uh, one or all, and you get the blue dichroism. Rotated by 45 degrees, the dichroism more or less goes away. Okay, so that's telling you that the magnetization is lying either, uh, it, it's either bi-actual, because if you look at, it's only actually you look at 45 degrees, it doesn't, it's going to be the same. If bi-actual you look at 45 degrees, it's going to be the same. But the interesting thing that happens here is if I rotate the whole thing by 90 degrees, the sign of the XNRP changes. Okay? So that was only going to happen if it's uni action. Okay? So here, it not only tells you that they, um, the moments are lying along a, a, a one or all, they're telling you that it's only lying along one of them. So this material, which is a thin copper manganese arsenide, shows uni action. Spatial resolution. Okay, if you can, so that was a difficult experiment. We can make it more difficult by, by collecting fewer, fewer photons over a rather small area. So the principle is the same. You just now have to uh, use a, some microscope optics and you only uh, shine your light, or sorry, sorry, shine your x ray on a small area and you only collect the uh, emitted uh, photoelectrons from a small area. So this is known as X P. And here's some linear, um, uh, linear magnetic diaphragm uh, results uh, using XP. And what this one is, you know, is picked up, is it's actually um, exchange coupling. It's, an, it's anti ferromagnetic nickel oxide with the same film of cobalt from on the top. Uh, and so, uh, left hand side here. You was actually imaging domains, large domains, in, by linear dichroism in the, in the antiferromagnet. And then you can see where there's some, there's some correspondence in the ferromagnetic domains in the, in the uh, layer that's on top of the antiferromagnet. Here's one of the Pete and Kevin images. Uh, um, I don't know if you can see this actually. Uh, it's all, nearly all of the same color. Okay. And that indicates that the, the, the uh, magnetization, the L vector was pointing the same direction everywhere, apart from these darker lines. And what this is, is this is a uni, this is uni actual behavior, and these are um, 180 degree domain walls um, separating them here. And this is rather nice because look at the strength of the XMLD signal across that domain wall, you can immediately get some measure of the width of the domain wall. That's totally. Uh, I said in TDM, you don't image 
individual atoms. But in an STM system, scanning <coughs> can be microscope, you can. So you, you know about this, but just to refresh, you, you, if you bring a sufficiently sharp tip very close to a very pristine surface, you can actually see uh, modulations in the tunneling current associated with physical modulations. Oh, sorry, to be clear. Sorry, it's, it's associated with the spatial variation of the density, tunneling densities. So you can do that. But you can do more. You can make your magnetic tip uh, magnetic. Very, very hard this. But you get, you get your tip and then you coat it. Um, and here, this is iron on tungsten. And it turns out that if you do that, the, the, there's an in-plane magnetization. Well, there isn't a plane, but you know, <coughs> at the very end of the tip, the point being perpendicular to the vertical. If you put a bit of um, gadolinium on it, and then, no, I mean gadolinium, sorry, iron on gadolinium on tungsten, it's perfect, perpendicular to all that. So then you can do experiments where you really can see the uh, magnetic order of the atomic scale. The atomic resolution, it's surface to mostly what's sensitive to the top monolayer, but you can actually see in certain circumstances a few monolayers below. So for instance, if you have the magnetic impurities uh, just below the surface, you do something about that. Um, so however, what you can't do is you can't go to someone with, someone with a spin polarized SDM system, give them a piece of dirty cup manganese arsenide or oxidized surface and say, measure that for me. Okay? This requirement of very pristine surfaces is very restricted. You can't have oxidation, you can't easily transport samples into the system. That's not quite shown in one way. So normally, I think everything I'll show you, it's only a couple of slides. What you actually have to do is you have to create your sample in the UHB chamber of the S with the scanning tool in microscope. Okay. So what people do is they, they grow monolayers or, or just a few monolayers of ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic material on a perfect crystal inside the vacuum chamber. There's another approach, and that is that you can do cross-sectional scanning um, uh, coming microscopy and been polarized in the microscopy. And there you have to take a, a, a put a crystal, actually break it, and hopefully it, it cleaves nicely and gives you a nice perfect surface. Either way, it's not easy. Uh, and also, just just uh, carry out here, that you are measuring the properties of uh, the top monolayer, okay? So that may not be typical of the properties of the bulk. In fact, you would normally expect it not. So obviously the local environment of that monolayer is not the same as the local environment of the corresponding layer somewhere in the bulk of the material. And you also get surface reconstruction. So the surface can actually be grossly different from the, from the uh, bulk because it relaxes to minimize the energy. All the same, you can put pictures out of this. So this is um, Langley's 3 nickel 2 very popular, um, and it's got a relatively complicated antiferromagnetic order. Uh, you've got two equivalent manganese sites, and the, um, the, uh, the nitrogen also acquires a, a moment in this system. But the nice thing about it is, you can see almost immediately from this picture, um, that if you scan across here, that these uh, rows of atoms are fainter than these. So the intensity is actually very not with the lattice parameter in that direction, but with twice. But it's got a part that's very with the lattice parameter, that's the black. And then it's got a magnetic signal. You can do an experiment with and without, with non-magnetic with a magnetic uh, tip. And you see this magnetic signal has got twice the uh, it's got uh, uh, twice the period. Okay. So this is actually directly imaging the spatial variation of the moron. It's a direct visualization of, of an uh, antiferromagnetic oil on the surface. Uh, that's some raw data. I really quite like this because I'm not 
well, I don't know what it looks like from your point of view, but I think I, I can see, actually, here you can see that the, the dominant period is uh, CO2, and here you can see that it's more like C, just above C. Okay. Nice not to have to process that all the data to convince yourself. So this is uh, from the Weizenbanger's group. Um, so this is one of those cases. Take a chunk of pure, then put a chunk of the crystal in it, deposit a model layer of iron on it. It turns out that the iron is anti ferromagnetic. And then you can look at this circuit. And it's, uh, it's with a spin polarized tip. And you can see here, in a nice order, here, nice order, and then something happens in between. There's a transition. And they've modeled this, and the modeling agrees really very well. And, and this is a domain wall. Okay, so you can actually very convincingly uh, image domain walls in this material here. So here's the magnetic signal varying, and then you can see the moments are tilting over. There's a better one here uh, where <coughs> they just average the intensity, the scanning direction, well, so the scanning both directions, but they average uh, along the rows in that direction. And they think what's happening is, see this up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, but it's, it's uh, counting over, uh, and again, it's a domain wall, like state. Well, they, this is more complicated. It's, it's, this is actually a spiral step. It's not an accidental domain wall. It just does, it does this period. It's periodic. It's man, uh, this is a manganese surface. Um, but I think you can see here that you see the intensity. Oh, sorry. It's sensitive to the perpendicular. This is a perpendicular step. It's sensitive to the, the perpendicular uh, variation in magnetization. So up, down, up, down, up, down here. But from side to side in the middle. So you've got hardly any content. Um, but to my knowledge, there's only two or three groups in the world who can do this sort of work. I think I'm nearly at the end. Oh, no, no. Mm -hmm. How long have we got? Uh, I'm sorry, I just said, I just said to talk something about AMR and then we'll stop. Um, Oh yeah, AMR, that's the audience participation. <laughs> they have to vote on what you think AMR is. Which shop please? What are we going to talk about? Really need your horse registers. I said of course Alaskan Malamut, but Malamut, yes. And the big cooking dogs apparently. Angry monkey racing. Advanced meat recovery. This is great, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> The good stuff goes here. And this is where you're getting your burdens. <laughs> <laughs> now, it was a trick cross question, none of the above. I'm going to say something about AMR. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about advanced meat recovery, but I started to read about it and that was very ill. Um, so, phenomenologically, uh, we normally think of anisotropic magnetic resistance as being the variation of the resistance of of a material that's magnetic, is magnetic, with the angle between the current and the magnetization. Now the in fact, so in its it seems intuitively obvious it's difficult to calculate that the density of states is, is going to depend on the direction the direction of the magnetization and the angular dependence of the scattering probability of the so if you put a magnetic field on, which is not uh, uh, a long high, then you're going to induce an anisotropy. In that situation, it appears, uh, so the resistance, the abnormal <coughs> resistance, the RXX, uh, varies um, as cos and theta. Uh, but very usefully, the, uh, there's a whole like uh, contribution, and then it's not really a whole like contribution. It's just off diagonal part of the AMR. And the nice thing here is that this, this might be a 1% variation on top of the normal R, whereas this uh, might be a small offset, but this should be varying by, um, from positive to negative positive. 
Okay, I just want to say a couple of things. Firstly, you have to be legislatively careful because this is, this is true, this is going to be correct for isotopic materials, but of course when you're in a crystal, then you've got built-in um, anisotropies anywhere. So I just to make you to show some old data. So you measure the, uh, the AMR in gamma rays last night along three to four, four different directions. It's very exciting as far as you expect, but the amplitude is different in different directions. So there's something else going on that's not captured by these simple formulae. So what we did was we worked with corbinal geometry. Yeah. 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 In a co carbinal geometry, you inject the current in the middle and it falls radially outwards. So this was a crystal, same crystal as the uh, guy in the last one. So now, the current is flowing equally in all directions. So when you vary the magnetic field, the, the average angle between the, uh, the magnetization and the current just stays the same. So you don't expect anything. And you can see something. And um, it's rather beautiful. And so what this is, is the, is the crystal contribution, the need crystalline contributions to the AMR. Okay, so you have to be careful. So uh, this is an approximation, but it's not a bad approximation, because often these signals levels are 10%, 5%, but it's a lot more, a lot less. <laughs> uh, this is probably Andy Russell's paper from a loop again. But the AMR is very important, as Thomas already said, and I'll just quickly show a couple of Thomas' slides. Because now, this is expected to be present also in the antiferromagnets. So here is the case of the ruthenium. Now, iron ruthenium works as ferromagnet, magnet, so you orientate it one direction and, and you cool down to it, and you get the spin flop transition. Okay? And if you did it in the opposite direction, it's been flops in the opposite direction. So now you've only got two directions, but the measured resistances are distinctly different. But then there's this great recent piece of work, which is the material of alpha magnetic telluride, where I showed you the top magnetometry earlier on. Thomas has already showed this. You see what's happening here is that uh, in appropriate that. Um, if you try to put a magnetic field on this out of plane, you've got an enormous anisotropy because this is a C axis, nothing happens. But you get a rather soft spin flop transition uh, in the other direction. Or you need to get a spin flop transition because also it's going to be multi it's going to be multi domain, so there's going to be domain more processes going on as well. But the nice thing here is that you apply the field and rotate and oh yeah sorry these are the the perpendicular and the parallel AMR and you get this beautiful behavior uh, moreover if you apply the field in different directions and cool and then take the field off you still get this multi-state uh, behavior that Thomas talked about so the AMR has been I'm sure continue to be a very important tool um, these things are great because you're, you're, you're putting a current sometimes in a you know, really small scale device, but you can still do the measurement. Whereas when you, go, when you do something like neutron scattering, you've got a real problem because it gets smaller, it gets more difficult. It doesn't make any difference. Everything scales in the same way. Um, I won't talk about Tony and my heat resistance, I don't think. But uh, yeah, so thank you for stopping the moment. So this is it. I quite like 1930s. I like the fact that these floating policemen smoking cigarettes. <laughs> but it's this phrase here. I was going to. I was going to. I was going to treat like a rally and finish with. You know, let's move on to control the universe. <laughs> They say that the measurement is much more difficult in high temperature, in the white things like that. And uh, uh, this kind of the high temperature is near the temperature or, um, or, or 
was the menu in the experiment. The um, well, experimental the alignment stick broader and broader because you, you, you have uh, more and more microns, more and more scattering. So it, it just becomes experimental. The, the line will start being right and wrong. As I understand it, it's not an experiment I've done myself. Experiments always complaining that there are so many other contributions to 
So I'm really surprised. I was just, I really wanted to ask, is V0 signal at copper actually yeah. at the end? Okay. And very clear one on the menu. So, what is your bomb? Yeah. <laughs> it's noise. It's not present in any other. It's not present in any other. Real questions. If that's not the case, then uh, thanks, Brian.